Hi, this is Brian Kim. I want to share with you this case of a patient who has a dense white cataract. And you're going to see half the lens is still in, and you're going to see a rather large posterior capsule defect. So you're going to see how I'm going to manage this. First, you have to have early recognition, and you'll see the signs as how I'm able to identify this posterior capsule rupture rather early in the case and then making the requisite steps of using viscoelastic to isolate the vitreous away from the remaining lens fragments and utilizing mechanical fracturing techniques to mechanically fracture the lens. By leveraging mechanical fracturing forces, I don't have to rely on ultrasonic energy or vacuum to grab and hold the lens pieces. Because remember, if you're grabbing lens pieces with vacuum, you're also gonna remove the viscoelastic and then encourage the vitreous to come forward. And then finally, you're going to see a pars plane of vitrectomy and how I'm able to do that in this context. And then lastly, a sulcus three-piece lens with optic capture. So this is a case you can see this is a rather white and chalky cataract. And it's got quite a bit of density as well. I make my paracentesis incision first on the right side and then the left side, making sure I'm parallel to iris plane, which creates a nice corneal shelf, which will allow me to achieve a self-sealing incision. This is intracameral epinephrine to stabilize the pupil. And then I pull the plunger back and then inject some intracameral air. And this is tripan blue. I'm going to paint the anterior capsule surface with it. I don't over inflate with the tripan blue. No reason to put that blue into the vitreous space and expose the retina to that dye. Using the cannula like a paint roller to paint over the anterior capsule. This is some dispersive viscoelastic to push the dye and the bubble out. You can see there's nice viscodilation of the pupil as well. This is a triplanar corneal incision. I make a vertical groove, place the blade into the deep part of the groove, tunnel, and then I enter. And these are the Moria microorexis forceps. And again, this is rather nice. It's got a nice sharp tip. I'm able to puncture the center and using that sharp tip, like a cystotome, pulling on the right side of the tear to create a flap. And because I was able to viscodilate the pupil, the corneal mark that I made simulates about the same size as the pupil in this case. And so I'll make the rexus about the size of the pupil here. Finish off the rexus, burp some viscoelastic out. And this is a capsule fornix hydrodissection technique. I place a cannula under the rexus edge contra incisionally, point the tip down. You can't see the wave, of course, because it's a white, dense cataract. Decompress the bag, sweeping on the left side and then the right side, and the lens begins to spin. Of course, as you've heard me say many times, these white cataracts, the cortex is fluffy and the epineuglis is fluffy. And in this context, the lens is typically not attached to the posterior capsule or the capsular bag. Lifting the incision with a chopper, going in with irrigation off to minimize decimase trauma, removing the surface epinuclear material, turning the bevel up, and then I switch to my dense mode and I go ahead and start sculpting. I sculpt a central trough. You can see there's some density to this lens. When you're dealing with a dense lens like this, there's a chance you're gonna get a posterior plate phenomenon. No reason to struggle with that situation. So I'm going to perform a terminal chop technique, and that essentially will overcome any potential for a posterior plate phenomenon. And this will allow me to easily disassemble this lens into two heminuclei. Turning the bevel down, switching to quad mode, placing the chopper around the rexus edge contra-incisionally, 
fracturing the lens, I'm able to place that fingertip deep into that groove, and I'm able to successfully fracture the lens completely in half. Placing the chopper around the right hand nucleus, hooking the peripheral lens, fracturing the lens around the right hand nucleus, and that is the cross chop. Placing the chopper around that first quadrant, hooking the peripheral lens, fracturing the lens one more time. That didn't quite work. I'm going to go ahead and do it again. Separating the pieces and then going after it again. Lifting that piece up. Trying to fracture it. But then I go ahead and just use some vacuum to lift it up. Once I lift it up, I'm able to fracture it with the instruments. With opposing forces and then emulsify the lens pieces. Separating the second quadrant from the rest of the lens, sliding the chopper around the lens. Because it's such a thick and chalky lens, it's hard for me to get that chopper around it. I finally am able to do that. Separating the fragments, placing the chopper again around the lens piece. Again, it's a rather big lens, swollen lens, and it's just having some trouble. I'm getting that chopper wedged between the anterior capsule and the lens piece. So it was better to just lift it up with some vacuum, fracturing it with opposing forces. You see, it just keeps turning on me. Finally fracturing it, lifting it with some vacuum, getting it up, fracturing it with opposing forces and emulsifying the lens pieces. So in this case, probably better to just grab it because it's just so stubborn and kind of stuck the lens is kind of wedged against the anterior capsule, so by using vacuum, it was actually more effective here. Again, crushing the lens between the instruments and then emulsifying the lens pieces. So right here is when I notice something funny. You see that lens fragment just underneath the chopper? Pay attention. As I apply aspiration and vacuum, look what happens to that piece. If I apply aspiration and vacuum, that piece should come towards me, but instead it's going away. And that's because there's a posterior capsule defect. So I use a chopper to lift that piece up away from the defect. And then I realize, okay, I got to stop here. So I go ahead and stop and I push viscoelastic into the bag. But before I do that, I'm going to tease that lens piece up away from the defect. And now you can see the defect more clearly. You can see it right there. As far as how it happened, Obviously, it's difficult to say the chopper must have gotten it. Again, the anterior capsule is intact. I'm pretty careful when I place the chopper out to the equator and I keep the bag inflated. So it's unusual for this to happen. This was very rare for me, but clearly something happened. Again, the anterior capsule is intact. So the chopper was successfully placed underneath the rexus edge. And of course, if the bag's inflated, I shouldn't have any problems. It's possible that the lens was tethered to the posterior capsule in that area because that was the primary location of the chops that I was performing. It must have ruptured the posterior capsule. So I'm using the dispersive viscoelastic cannula to tease the lens pieces away from the defect. And then I push the viscoelastic and I'm creating a wall between the vitreous and posterior capsule defect and the lens pieces that are in the bag. So I switch back to the chopper and then I'm going to go ahead and try to bring these lens pieces up. So this is the key. Make sure you bring the pieces up to your fingertip and then start vacuum. And I did this somewhat successfully. You're going to see when I didn't do it successfully. So right here, I'm doing a good job making sure those pieces are right at my tip. And I'm emulsifying those lens pieces very well. Everything's going great. And this is where I made a mistake. You see that? I went after it with vacuum and look what happens. I basically ate all that OVD. You saw the posterior capsule defect kind of move suddenly. And that is not the way to do it. I should have hooked that lens piece up with the chopper, but that's okay. I ate that piece, pushed some more viscoelastic, again, dispersive viscoelastic to create a wall between the posterior capsule defect and the vitreous and the lens pieces. Now see here, I do this cool maneuver that I developed 
where I'm basically tease the lens piece up sub incisionally rather than rotating in front of me. Again, the typical technique is to rotate that lens, that hemi-nucleus in front of me. If I did that, I would push that piece into the posterior capsule defect. But instead, I used the chopper and the phaco tip to tease the lens from the subincisional space and up into the anterior chamber. And again, see, I'm doing such a good job in fracturing the lens with mechanical fracturing forces and then buzzing the lens and emulsifying the lens piece. You can see here, I'm trying to keep that vitreous back. So I go ahead and push the more dispersive viscoelastic to plug up the hole and keep the vitreous back. I'm also coating the corneal endothelium for this last piece. But the point of the matter is I'm trying to use mechanical forces to fracture the lens into smaller and smaller pieces, bring the piece to the tip, and then fracturing the lens pieces when those pieces are on the tip. By doing it that way, you're making sure you're eating the piece rather than removing the viscoelastic. The last thing you want to do is remove viscoelastic because it's going to encourage more vitreous to come forward. So here, this last piece, I fractured that piece, but you see it just flew towards the hole. And that's because there's no viscoelastic. When you see pieces moving very fast in the anterior chamber, that means you don't have viscoelastic there. So that's another telltale sign. So I stop, and then I push some more viscoelastic to plug up the hole. And again, these are just small pieces, but the last thing I would want is for those pieces to fly into the vitreous space. And I'm keeping that chopper deep and then very carefully making sure I brought the phaco tip right up to that piece and I ate it. Making sure that you bring that piece right to the port of the phaco tip allows you to make sure you have a better chance of eating the piece before you eat the OVD. Now that I'm done, I take the chopper out, push more viscoelastic in, push the posterior capsule back, plug up the hole, make sure no vitreous in the anterior chamber, and then I come out with the phaco tip. At this point, I'm inspecting my anterior capsule, making sure I put more dispersive viscoelastic to lift the iris, and making sure I can see that the anterior capsule is intact. And then I go back here with the Maltzman, making sure I'm retracting the iris, and I'm able to see confidently that the anterior capsule is intact 360 degrees. And this is important because now I know how I'm going to place the lens. I'm widening the incision for my three-piece lens, and I'm placing the lens into the sulcus, and then optic capturing the optic through the rexus opening in a buttonhole configuration. By doing it that way, the optic will be stable. The lens will not be rotating and propelling in the sulcus space. You see here, as you push that injector in, it causes viscoelastic to come out. And that's very important that you push viscoelastic simultaneously to stabilize the chamber, as you see here. And then I push some more viscoelastic, cohesive viscoelastic. I'm turning the eye away from me because I'm able to now see the rexus edge. And I'm able to push that leading haptic into the sulcus space, visualizing it confidently by rolling the eye away from me. And so that's an important tip. I'm simultaneously pushing viscoelastic in rolling the eye away from me, being able to visualize the rexus edge in this borderline pupil, and then I'm able to dial the trailing haptic into the ciliary sulcus. So now both haptics are in the sulcus. Now I will say I feel like I almost performed a flawless surgery, except right here. I go in with high infusion pressure, and there's no reason to go in with high infusion pressure when you've got the lens inside the sulcus, you've optic captured it, all you're trying to do is remove the viscoelastic from the anterior chamber. But instead, by having high infusion pressure, I'm really putting a high pressure head into the eye. And remember, that infusion pressure is going to probably go into the vitreous space. And if I push and hydrate more BSS into the vitreous space, it's going to hydrate the vitreous space. It's going to cause a chamber to collapse, and it's going to cause vitreous to come to the wound. And so again here, I got so fixated on making sure my optic capture configuration has been achieved, and I'm using the Lester hook to make sure that I have good optic capture.
but in the process of doing that, you can see through my left side paracentesis incision with all that manipulation, that high infusion pressure is causing fluid to come out of that incision, but also simultaneously, you can see there's vitreous coming out of that incision. And you know this because as I hydrate my wound, you can see that little white dollop right on that incision, that paracentesis. So right here, rather than pulling away, I know there's vitreous, I'm just holding it there and trimming. So again, you're not yanking back with the wex cell just to see if I have vitreous. I know I do have vitreous. Just hold it there and you're using the wex cell to grip the vitreous and then you're amputating. By doing it that way, you're not yanking on the vitreous base. And once I do that and I trim the vitreous, I go ahead and place a 10 nylon suture over my main incision. I bury the suture and then I inflate the eye. And why am I inflating the eye? Remember I told you, you had high infusion pressure, you've hydrated the vitreous and what happened? It caused the chamber to collapse. The lens iris diaphragm came forward and now I have this shallow chamber. So instead I'm gonna go ahead and do a pars plane of vitrectomy. So I have filled the eye with BSS, I have a firm globe, and I did that because I also have sutured my wound. I indent the sclera with the backside of the trocar. I tunnel about three millimeters from the mark, and I tunnel tangentially, making a nice scleral tunnel, and then I dive down perpendicularly. And so this is my AC cannula. It's a 20 gauge AC cannula. And I'm going through my paracentesis incision on the left side. I'm trying to debate if I should go through the front or the back. And what I decided was I'm going through the pars plana first. And by doing that, we look at the deepening of the chamber. I did a little bit of vitrectomy and it really deepened that chamber really nicely. And once I did that, I was able to go anterior there was a small little fragment there. I gobbled that piece up. I removed the vitreous that was attached to the left side incision. And then I go back through the trocar. I'm able to do a nice parse plane of vitrectomy. You can see as I'm doing the vitrectomy, I'm making sure that I'm not eating the posterior capsule, making sure I'm over the defect only because that's where the vitreous is coming from. I don't have to go and do vitrectomy elsewhere. Just do it right over the defect. And you can see here, I'm using the AC cannula to retract the iris, making sure that I can see where I'm doing vitrectomy as I'm doing it. And this also allows me to confirm that I'm achieving optic capture as I'm doing this as well. But you don't have to move the vitrector too much. You're not doing INA, you're doing vitrectomy. And you're just trying to make sure that the vitreous is completely removed right over the posterior capsule defect. Again, the AC cannula is a 20 gauge AC cannula. It maintains a high infusion pressure. I keep the cannula in, take the vitrector out, and then with infusion on, I'm using the Lester to make sure that I am achieving optic capture still. And I'm able to ensure and confirm that I'm keeping that buttonhole configuration of the optic through the rexus edge. And because I removed that vitreous, you can see how deep the chamber is. So again, it's important in some cases you have a vitreous loss and you are starting to hydrate the vitreous throughout the case. Well, then of course, then the entire chamber is going to shallow. And it's really a, a challenge because then you're fighting against yourself. But you saw immediately, once I placed the trocar in and I did just a little bit of pars plane of vitrectomy, that chamber opened up so nicely the lens fell back, the iris diaphragm fell back, and I have so much more room to work doing the vitrectomy, not only from the posterior side, but also the anterior side. I'm able to make sure there's no vitreous whatsoever in the anterior chamber. I have so much space. And I think this is another reason why this contributes to a lot of high pressures. You know, you have vitreous loss, you don't do an adequate vitrectomy, and what essentially you've created this very crowded anterior segment. But just because you've hydrated the vitreous, so go ahead and do the vitrectomy. There's nothing wrong with that. So you can see here, I'm doing a peripheral iridectomy using the vitrector and make a nice discrete surgical iridectomy temporally on this eye. And I did this because again, I have a sulcus lens.
and I want to make sure I don't have any issues with iris chafing to the haptics. You can see I kept the AC cannula in the eye the entire time to maintain infusion pressure because you don't want the chamber to collapse and cause vitreous to come forward. And also, this also maintains the optic capture configuration. You don't want the chamber to collapse and, and alter that. But as I take the cannula out, you can see I'm manually pushing BSS with the cannula and quickly hydrate my incisions. And you can see now I switched hands. I'm pushing BSS with the cannula. And as I'm doing that, I check with the Lester. Final check to make sure I'm maintaining optic capture configuration. And I hydrate my incisions. Once I've filled the anterior chamber and the eye is nice and firm, I pull the trocar out. And as I pull it out, I tamponade the sclerotomy with a cotton tip. And then as you can see, there's no ballooning of the conch, which means I have a nice self-sealing incision. Fill the eye with more BSS, make sure you get physiologic pressure. And then I'm injecting subconjunctival antibiotics and steroids. And that's the end of the case. So this patient had posterior capsule rupture. I had half the lens in. The anterior capsule was intact. Obviously, I noticed that something was wrong because as I was trying to grab that piece, if I use vacuum and aspiration, that piece should come towards me because I have a closed system. But when that piece started migrating away from me, you knew that meant there's a posterior capsule rupture because that means there's fluid flow going out through the hole. And that's why that piece was following the fluid currents through the hole. So I stopped, made sure I use viscoelastic, a dispersive viscoelastic cannula to isolate that piece tees that piece back up into the anterior chamber and then push dispersed the viscoelastic elastic to create a wall between the lens piece as well as the posterior capsule defect and vitreous i use mechanical fracturing forces to crush the lens pieces into smaller and smaller pieces and you only want to activate the fake tip once you have the lens piece right up against the fake tip so you can emulsify that lens piece quickly because if you don't what happens you're going to eat OVD, and if you eat OVD, you're removing that wall that you've created to protect yourself from that vitreous and posterior capsule defect. But as I was eating pieces, of course, naturally viscoelastic comes out. You saw I made that one mistake of trying to grab that one fragment with a vacuum, and then suddenly all that OVD escaped. Very poor technique. Again, remember that. Anytime you have this situation, bring the lens piece to your tip and then eat it. Don't try to grab it with vacuum. Remember, you have an open system, not a closed system. So when you remove the viscoelastic, pieces can go through the hole. So instead, I was able to stop, plug up the vitreous and the posterior capsule defect with a wall of OVD. And then you saw my technique of using the chopper and the fico tip to tease the lens from the sub-incisional space. Again, most of the time, people just turn that lens piece around. And if I did that, I'd be pushing it right into that hole. That's really a bad idea. So you saw using that cool maneuver that I've developed where you place the chopper underneath the rexus edge sub-incisionally and rotating that chopper and fago tip, I'm able to grab it and tease it. You saw I was kind of using two hands to basically gently tease it up out of the bag. I was able to pop that sub-incisional hemonucleus up out of the bag into the anterior chamber, fracture it using mechanical fracturing forces, crushing it into smaller and smaller pieces. And then it, again, placing the fake tip against the lens piece, emulsifying it. And again, anytime I feel like there's OVD that's being removed, I just stop and then plug up that defect to make sure the vitreous doesn't come forward. And it's very important, I didn't say that earlier, you wanna make sure you don't 
push too much OVD as you're plugging up the hole. So remember, if you push too much OVD, you're going to distend the posterior capsule and cause the posterior capsule defect to grow. So it's a fine balance. You want to be able to plug up the hole, but don't distend the posterior capsule because then you're going to cause the defect to grow and stretch out. And so it's a fine balance. Push some viscoelastic in. You can even push it into the hole itself. And then go ahead and emulsify the lens pieces as you saw how I did. I protected the posterior capsule with a chopper. And then before I came out with the FACO tip, I pushed more viscoelastic to plug up and fill up the anterior chamber with viscoelastic. And then I placed that lens into the ciliary sulcus, a three-piece lens, and then optic captured the optic in a buttonhole configuration. Again, my one mistake was I kept that high infusion pressure. I could have reduced that infusion pressure, dropped that IOP to like 30 instead of whatever it was, 60 something. And that would have reduced that pressure head. I wouldn't have hydrated vitreous so much and it wouldn't have caused that chamber to shallow. But it happened, that's okay. I went ahead and stopped made sure I checked with the wex cell for the vitreous, but don't yank the wex cell away from the incision. You don't have to do that. You know there's vitreous there. Just place it right over the incision and the wex cell grips the vitreous. You can just trim it as you go. Therefore, you're not putting any traction, but you're able to effectively amputate that vitreous, that externalized vitreous from the wound. And then I placed a tenonolin suture to my main incision. And then I inflated the eye with BSS, making sure I have a nice firm globe. You need to have a firm globe if you're going to place a trocar into the sclera. And so I indented the sclera. And then I tunneled about three millimeters towards my indentation mark. And I dive down perpendicular. And you know that I have a nice scleral tunnel because the trocar is tilted sideways a little bit. And that means I have an excellent tunnel, which means I should have a good chance that I'm going to have a self-sealing incision, which I did. And you saw immediately as I placed that vitrector into the trocar, it immediately deepened the chamber, which was fantastic. And then I was able to remove that small fragment in the anterior chamber through a limbal approach, removing the vitreous from the anterior chamber and from my incision. By removing all that vitreous, I'm able to reduce the hydration of the vitreous because I'm removing that vitreous. I have a better chamber, and of course, you'll have better IOP control postoperatively. You saw a clear cornea, again, a rock cataract, and recognized early a posterior capsule rupture defect, removing lens, large lens pieces out of the bag, using mechanical forces to crush the lens pieces, isolating the lens piece from the posterior capsule defect and the vitreous. And I was able to salvage this potentially disastrous situation and achieve an excellent result. So I hope this was helpful to you, and I thank you for your attention.